And now for somebody, onto somebody who knows who she is and what it's all about, the Cathy Sinnott interview. Absolutely. Um, hold on a second, I'm not closing down the folder by accident there. <laughs> it was actually Whoops. in, so we have to... We've had, a, we've had the, as the Germans say, the worm was here tonight. We've something, yeah. we've had a couple of hitches or <laughs> glitches or whatever you want to call them. It's all gone a bit crazy. Yeah. There we go. Pre-recorded interviews. Cathy Sinners. This is the pre-recorded inter- interview uh, I recorded about a w- over a week ago with Cathy. It's excellent. I hope you get a chance to listen to it in its entirety. On Skype, we have Cathy Sinners, who was an MEP for the South of Ireland uh, for five years. Is that right, Cathy? Five years, yeah. Yeah, and Cathy is on talking about uh, the upcoming referendum on children's rights that hasn't, there's no date been set yet, but it's something that's very close to Cathy's heart, and we're going to have a, a good, strong debate about the importance of highlighting the new legislation that um, is, is coming from the UN, Cathy, is it? Yes, it's all come from the UN. Okay. Well, you're very welcome to the show, Cathy. Um, myself and Paul are, uh, are going to go through uh, quite a few questions in relation to this. We've been, we've been doing, a bit, doing a bit of research into uh, what exactly what you're talking about. And uh, to be honest with you, we didn't know very much about it. Paul, did you know, know anything about this before? Absolutely nothing. It's the first time I've come across it. Uh, yeah, yeah, so... Yeah. so um, and- yeah, go on, Cathy. Well, maybe maybe I can quickly tell you why I know about it. Yeah, go, um, go, yeah. go in the in, Yeah, in the late 1980s, I happened to have a friend who lived in an apartment in New York. She was raising her kids there, but they actually, they some of them were in school in Ireland. Mm-hmm. And she was, just as a volunteer, she used to kind of go up on down to the UN several days a week, and she would monitor. She had a badge and a pass. And she would just give her time uh, to monitor what was happening in the area of family, life, children. Mm-hmm. And um, she was seeing something happen that was quite worrying to her. And she used to tell me about it when she would visit Ireland. And so I, I kind of heard this stuff. And it seemed like something on the moon, you know, that that there was um, basically what was happening is there was a great head of UNICEF. We've all heard of UNICEF there, the UN's Children Fund. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there was this great head called Dr. Grant. And this man probably saved more lives. I mean, in fact, what was said about him at his, at his funeral was that he saved more lives than Hitler, Stalin, and Mao took. Right. And he saved because he, he was the head of UNICEF and he was very focused on keeping children alive. So hydration, you know, clean water, uh, pumps, wells, uh, basic nutrition, uh, good maternal services, you know, that babies weren't dying in childbirth. And, you know, just he was, he was all about keeping kids alive and, and giving them a good start in life. So he was a humanist. But there was, uh, well, very much. Yeah. And he was, he was just a good guy. And he had come out of, um, you know, dealing with things like earthquakes and things like that. So he knew, you know, I mean, we think of an earthquake and we think of emergency services, but there are countries that are, live in that state all the time. And, yeah. and he knew how to deal with that. And he was mm-hmm. great. But there was a stream which she was monitoring in the UN that were trying to redefine everything. And they had targeted, you know, I mean, the whole convention on women mm-hmm. called CEDAW was brought in. And some people love it. Some people hate it. I think that it, it may have opened things up for women in some areas and absolutely is the most anti-women document in other areas. Mm-hmm. But, you know, they, they were in. And so they were they were heading into to UNICEF. Mm-hmm. And with an agenda that was about state control. It was about UN control, global control, and that was done through their agents, which were the individual nations. Because really in the UN, if you look at their documents, they don't see Ireland as Ireland. Ireland is their agent in this, this corner of the world. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? The, sure, it's a corporation. Whatever the government is. It's a corporation. Yeah, absolutely. 
Kathy, yeah, if, you, if, you, if you look... And at, I, I would have seen this very much yeah, in Brussels if, if, as if, well. You know, i just the, pause you there for a know, second. If, if you actually go to a website called Dunn on Bradstreet, if you type in the Republic of Ireland, what you will find is that Ireland is listed as a corporation as well as the Garda Síochána, the Law Society, the Department of Justice, the Department of Agriculture. Plus, they're all corporations. Plus the HSE here. I have three pages on the HSE alone in Dunn and Bradstreet. Yes. Yes, yes. Well, you know, I, I mean, I would have, I, I haven't been to that website, but I would have known that in Brussels because Ireland was well, never Ireland. Yeah. Ireland was just the North Corner, mm -hmm. which they had signs on and, and that was it, you know. And, and they wouldn't even be annoyed when we would look for a bit of sovereignty or, or assert our rights or something. It was more like a you know, an annoyance, like a fly that was buzzing around their head or sure, something. Sure, sure, yeah. Because what is that silly woman saying? <laughs> Pardon? To be like, what yeah. is that silly no, woman a... saying, saying now, you know? That, that'd be their attitude yeah. towards him, yeah. sure, you know? Well, we are a minority in Europe. Oh, yeah. We're only 4 million out of uh, 250, isn't it? 250 million people in the EU? But it, did, it didn't matter. The, the attitude was the same for Spain or anybody else, yeah. uh, except the biggest. With Germany and France. Could, could the you, attitude was... Could, could you give us a, a brief synopsis of how the EU political structure works? Because you were there for many years, and, no, and people in this country have no idea how it actually works. <laughs> I'm not sure I could do it that briefly, but I, I, I try to be as brief as I okay, can. Okay, go for it. Okay. Uh, the way that Europe works is that the, the council... Um, well, the commission runs everything. Mm-hmm. The council, which are our heads of state, basically France and Germany are, mm. are pretty much run that. Okay. You know, what Germany wants, what Germany wants, Germany gets with a little bit of, uh, nodding the head towards France, a bit mm. of compromising towards France. But basically, you know, they, they would say that the council gives the direction and gives the orders and the commission merely like the good servant puts it into effect. But that's not true. Okay. Uh, you know, Germany decides what it wants with whoever, you know, with whatever international interests, etc. The council gives the direction and then the commission, uh, makes legislation, etc. But the reality is the commission is an enormous engine. It's a, it's, I think about a 20,000 strong, incredibly well paid civil service mm -hmm. and and many really good people in it i mean sure. i met people who really cared and, and were really trying to to do things but the mindset is always that they're dealing with this one big country which is this one big block which is part of the world set of blocks if you like mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. the commission then will produce legislation and it goes to the Parliament. And as far as I could see, and I think I was in the Parliament at the right time because before Lisbon, you could get a, you could get more done. Okay. Even though when it came down to it, what the Commission wanted, the Commission would get. Mm -hmm. But when you went into who wrote the stuff in the Commission, yes, the civil servants would, would say write the legislation or the policy, but their advisors were the multinationals. Right. And I remember at stage we were having an argument because there was something in, in health and they were going to, um, write this legislation. They were going to review this with a committee they were setting up. And, and for some reason we were given vetting option on this committee. Mm -hmm. And everybody on this committee seemed to have been working for multinationals that had a lot to gain by, I can't remember what it was, but a lot to gain with whatever this legislation would so be. So they lobbied the and legislators, so. They, well, they, they were going them, to yeah. put these people, these experts, doctor this and professor mm -hmm. that and all the rest, on this committee that were going to advise the commission, basically write the legislation in this specialized area. Mm -hmm. And we pointed out that every one of them had worked for pharmaceuticals or, you know, whatever multinational. And their answer to us was a very blasé, well, these are the experts. And if we don't take someone, you know, you're not going to find an expert except someone that's worked in this area. Mm -hmm. You know, so basically, uh, it, it's like when we, we expose that the EFSA, which is the European Food Safety Authorities, 
document on artificial sweeteners that one of the main committee members, if not the head, I can't remember now, but it, one of the main committee members had been lifetime careers working in the artificial sweetener industry. Oh my God, it's ridiculous. And of course, EFSA, yeah, EFSA found that there wasn't really any problem. You know, we should keep an eye on it, but no cause for alarm with aspartame or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know? So that, so the, the commission, and as I say, there's some very good people in the commission and they really try their hardest, but there's a lot of vested interest. So the commission send us legislation into the parliament and we can vote it down. We also put in amendments and I used to be putting in amendments all the time and, um, you know, we can try to change it, but I'll give you an example. If the commission wants something, which might mean if a multinational wants it or if Germany wants it or whatever. But if the commission really wants it, the commission's going to get it. And we waste months of hard work and lobbying for amendments and things that just get swept away. And a good example, when they were redoing the waste directive, I fought really hard and really lobbied for every last vote to keep incineration as disposal. Mm-hmm. Right, which meant that there would be a lot more regulation, a lot more, you know, cost to disposal, etc. In other words, if you're going to burn it, you're you're dumping, you're disposing. But the the incineration lobby and industry wanted it called recovery, on the basis that they were going to recover energy from heat. Mm-hmm. And we fought that battle, and we won. So when the legislation went through to the the update of the waste directive, we kept incineration as disposal. Mm-hmm. And it went to the commission, and basically the commission rejected it. Okay. So this time when it went back to the parliament, we needed a two-thirds majority to keep it at disposal. And so we worked all the harder, you know, talking. I mean, the amount of talking you had to do to, you know, get the swing votes and to, you know, keep people steady. And, of course, there were lunches being put on and, you know, free pens and all kinds of things about recovery and all this sort of thing. (laughs) So we managed to just barely get the two-thirds. It went back to the commission, and the commission rejected it again. And basically, it's now called recovery mm-hmm. in the waste directive. Incineration is recovery. So, you know, the parliament is there, and when it suits, I mean, the commission, they might have wanted to do it one way, and the parliament do another. Okay, we can live with that. But when it comes down to it, and it's something that the commission wants, the commission gets it no matter what the parliament does. So it's, it's very and like, it's very like uh, the veto that the American president has. Well... It's a little, at least the veto is out front and center and you can see it happen. Okay. You know, it, the commission, what they have then is they will have a, an, a, a big meeting. When it comes to a deadlock, they have this meeting and they often go till three and four in the morning till people are worn down and then they agree a compromise. And the compromise always includes the key piece. Okay, the commission will give some things, mm-hmm. but it always includes key piece. And and I'll give you one I don't want to give lots of examples because I want to get back to children's rights, sure. but I remember in one case it was the night before the seventh framework. No, it was the uh advanced medicines. It it was we had two different pieces of legislation. It kind of basically happened the same in both. Um the advanced medicines directive Anyway, mm-hmm. it it involved things like um, embryo research, yeah. cloning, um, and animal-human, you know, chimeras, animal-human hybrids. Right. You know, this sort of... Nasty stuff. Yeah. You know, Frankenstein, nasty yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. I couldn't have put it better. Yeah. Pretty nasty stuff. And mm. we were trying to say, look, that European funds don't go to that. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, you know, if a country like the UK have already legislated that you can do that nasty stuff, okay, but, but it won't be done out of European funds. That was the seventh framework directive. And the advanced medicines directive was that it, it just, we don't, 
blend animals and humans. You know, we don't breed them. You know, we don't do that in Europe, you know. Mm -hmm. And we were told, and, and there was good support for that in mm. the parliament, you know. I mean, particularly, in, and in fact, I think the reason we were getting so far is that it was one of the things that touched a chord in Germany. Um, sure. You know, in Germany, they still had that sort of memory of Hitler and eugenics, and, you know, he had that breeding project where he was breeding all his blonde soldiers to Norwegian blonde Norwegian women, and, you know, they had... So it, it touched that chord, and, and Germany was... A lot of German MEPs were with us on that. Okay. And um, so it had a good chance of success. And I was what was called a shadow on it. So mm -hmm. I was leading the group I was with, which was just a very independent group. It left me free to do whatever I wanted. And I was leading that in this legislation. So we, I was in all the insider meetings. And I remember the commission coming the council representatives coming and we were, and the parliament, we were all sitting around, all the leading MEPs with them. And they basically told us, it doesn't matter how you vote next week in Strasbourg. We're going to include this in the legislation. Mm -hmm. So really don't waste your time. Wow. And that was it. Mm -hmm. And I, and I even said to him, so you're telling us it doesn't matter how we vote. We're going in next week to vote on this and you're telling us it doesn't matter. And they said, no. Wow. They said, say it any way you like, but that's actually the reality. Yeah, that's not and the first time. The thing is, that. in the end, we lost the vote. And I maintain we lost it because they made it very plain in the debates that it was going to go through. And so people will, you know, it just, it, you know, it's like deflating a balloon. Yeah. People go away and all your swing voters, well, you know, they don't like to be seen to vote for what doesn't win. Mm -hmm. So, but that anyway, I I I diverge there, but that's kind of the way it is. But it's important, However, Carrie, for people to understand what exactly is going on in the background. It's very important for people to understand that. Do you know what I mean? We do need to understand the processes that are in place and the intellectual bullying that goes on in, in the, the larger political establishments that are in Europe. You know. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Now, having said that. Um, I would, the only justification for being an MEP is to be independent because then you can do lots of other things. Like I got some really good research projects, uh, particularly in the area of disability, but in other things and, you know, things like that. You, you can use your position to just really push, you know, advocate for people and, and do all that. And that's all really good. Mm -hmm. But once Liz came in, any wriggle room within the parliament, you know, I, I, I'm not convinced, mm -hmm. you know, that they're, you know, I mean, it was hard enough as it was. Mm -hmm. I'm not convinced that there's that much of it left. Okay. Okay. Um, so moving on then to the, um, you know, the children's rights, which is the main reason well, why. That, I'll, I'll just quickly, yeah, I'll just quickly finish okay. why, you know, why I've been following the children's rights. Okay. Well, you know. This woman, Mrs. Garvey, would fill me in about it. And I was just, you know, this is, I was a mom. I had young kids. You know, I couldn't even imagine this kind of supervision of parents and, you know, the kind of agenda that was building up. And, and she was quite worried about it. Mm -hmm. So um, I kind of lost touch with it. And then as her kids graduated here and, you know, I didn't see her as much. And then I went to court. Uh, to the high court in in a test case. It was for my son, but it was really for every child in the country mm -hmm. that they get the education that they are promised. In other words, the education based on their needs. So that, you know, people, I hear them say oh, it was an autism case. It wasn't. You could be a gifted child. You could be, you know, a normally developing child. And it was about the fact that you were entitled to a primary education according to your need, whatever that was. Mm -hmm. And that that had been promised, you know, guaranteed, regardless of cost in the Constitution. Oh, I, rem I remember that no case, agent. yeah. I remember that, yeah. Yeah. So it was the Senate case. But what I didn't realize, the arguments they kept coming out with were, you know, I, I kept thinking, well, that's not in the Constitution. This was a constitutional case. Mm -hmm. And they kept saying, well, subject to resources. And we would say, it's not subject to resources. Yeah. Other things in the Constitution... This isn't. Or they would say, 18, childhood ends at 18. And we were saying to them, well, 
he's still 18 months in yeah. a lot of area and yeah. four years is his highest, you know, uh, rating in, you know, in, in one area and everything else is down from that. How is he in, how does he not need a primary education? How is he not a child in educational terms? Mm -hmm. And they kept going 18 and we were saying, well, why not 25? Why not 16? Mm. And there were all, there were other things like that. And it was only then when I, well, it was only when I was in Brussels. Um, and, and the funny thing, when it, the case was appealed to the Supreme Court, the two issues they appealed was the exclusive right of the state to decide what was appropriate to a child. So judges couldn't dictate what a child got and nor parents. And the 18 year old, the childhood ends at 18. And this really, I, you know, I, I mean, I could see reasons for it, but none so compelling that they would drag it through the Supreme Court. Yeah. So, and then my case, there was a case for me, which I had also won where I relied on Article 40, Article 41, Article 42, all of them, the, the woman in the home, which is actually the carer in the home. Mm -hmm. That's man or woman. Even though it says woman, the, the high court has a good while ago, already established it's the person doing caring duties in the home. So carers, man or woman. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we relied on all those. I won on all those counts. Mm -hmm. And they absolutely appealed every bit of my case. And, and I didn't understand their vehemence about it mm. until I got to Brussels. And in Brussels, I found myself, again, because I was the vice president of Family and Child Protection Intergroup, I again was the shadow, the lead on on uh, the children's rights. Mm -hmm. And the children's rights was one of the many bits of legislation they were doing to prepare for Lisbon because, of course, they had put children's rights in the, in the Charter of Fundamental Rights in Lisbon. So when we voted for Lisbon, yeah. we locked in this UN treaty on children's rights, and which I... And sneakily done and nobody knew which, anything about it. Yeah, and no one knew anything about it. So they locked it in, and when I started to read it, Mm -hmm. and and really went back and read it. I thought, oh, that's what they were doing in the high court. That's what they, these are the words directly taken and put into high, high court, but they never in court in all 27 days of the Senate case and in all the whatever, five or six days in the Supreme Court, they never said the word, the Uni United Nations Convention on the mm -hmm. Rights of the Child. No. So then, in, in fact, in in Brussels, they gave, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is what this is all about, as an example of one of the of of a treaty that the EU could ratify as the EU, as the country the EU, once Lisbon was passed. Mm -hmm. And which they intended to ratify because it had been ratified by Germany and France and Italy and, and all the countries, but they the EU would ratify it. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so I went back to that so I went back to that, and um, it was very interesting because I then went back to Ireland's ratification. And now just to explain to listeners, this treaty was written. It's called the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, and if you type that in, you'll get the convention and read it. And read it, and I'll explain the key to reading it, because the language you might think, oh, that sounds okay, that sounds okay. But the the issue about the treaty is that you had two warring factions in UNICEF when it was written between 1989 and 1991. Mm -hmm. You had grants trying to keep children alive, and so there are good things in it about, you know, really the children's basic right to nutrition and stuff mm -hmm. like that, which is all good. And you had the agenda side, which was tipped Typified by the next head of UNICEF, Carol Bellamy. She kind of was leading the charge there. Mm -hmm. And she, a very radical uh, agenda person, and she was bringing in the agenda that the state controlled children and that parents had to be on, on probation, under state supervision, that the parents didn't were not the ones who decided what was good for children. It was the state, and then the parents carried it out. We were agents of the state. Yeah. And so a complete reversal of, if you like, the natural order, the way it's always been done. Um, and and the thing is, and, and then in addition to that, 
Oh, I'll bring up the edition in a minute. So what happened anyways? They, this, this convention was pushed for by the agenda people. Grant was not interested in a convention. He was just interested in saving children. The agenda people who had gotten into UNICEF put on a lot of pressure for a, a convention. And a convention winds up being a treaty, a binding international treaty, just like Lisbon yeah. or anything else. And it was promulgated, if you like, in 1992. And in 1992, Ireland had a right to to ratify it or not, and it had a right to ratify it with reservations. Now, what Ireland should have done at the time is said, this is so in contradiction to our constitution, we have to ask the people. Mm-hmm. So they should have had a referendum if they were going to ratify it. Or, alternatively, they could have refused to ratify it, as the United States did. Or they could have... No, the, the United States only refused some time later. They just didn't ratify it at first because the Clinton administration knew they weren't going to get it past Congress. Mm -hmm. And it was in Bush's attorney general that, that refused, that told the United States to refuse it. Okay. Because he said, and this was an exact quote he told me personally. He said, when I met him in Strasbourg, he said, I realized it was a revolution. It was the end of the family. So, um, but anyway. He, He didn't mean that in a good way, by the way. No, in a bad way. Yeah. You know, this is the end of the family. The state became the parent. Yeah. You know, the, the family no longer was, if you like, the natural habitat of the child. Yeah. The state was the habitat, and and the family, at you know, was allowed to carry out certain duties. Mm-hmm. On suffrage. On suffrage. So, anyway... Um, Ireland, now some countries did put in reservations. For instance, all the Muslim countries said that they would ratify it, in other words, bind themselves, legally bind themselves at the highest level to this convention, except where it contradicted Sharia. So in other words, they didn't bind themselves at all. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And um, the, the UK, now in the preamble it mentions a child before and after birth. And the preamble's not legally binding. Mm -hmm. But just to be sure, the UK ratified it on the basis it only applied to children after birth. Nicaragua ratified it on the basis that it applied to children before birth. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, different countries put in different reservations based on their constitution or whatever. Yeah. Uh, The Vatican, for instance, ratified it in as far as it upheld the primacy of the family and of parents. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So, in other words, that they actually neutralized all the the bad bits. Um, and and I want to state right now, absolutely, this is not about abuse or anything like that. You know, in the Irish Constitution, if a parent fails their children, mm-hmm. then the state must step in. Mm-hmm. You know, we we're not talking about an absolute right of parents to hang on to their children if they don't take care of them. Sure. It's absolutely necessary that the wider community steps in on mm-hmm. an abusive parent or a, a, a seriously negligent parent. Yeah. And but many parents just need support and help. Mm-hmm. They don't you want. Know, they don't want their, their parenting their power taken away from them. Like. Yeah, a lot of kids are being taken away from parents who actually there isn't a problem, or from parents who just need help. Mm-hmm. You know, and and. In fact, sometimes kids are taken away when they do need to be for their own safety. Mm -hmm. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about responsible parents. So anyway, what happened is Ireland, now I only have met one person who was, who saw it coming and she saw it coming because she knew the same woman I knew in New York, Mm -hmm. Mrs. Garvey. Mm -hmm. So she saw it coming. She was a solicitor here in Cork. Uh, and daily, she wrote to the government and warned them that they couldn't ratify it. It was way out of whack with the Constitution. They would need to go to the people, and that if they were going to ratify it, they needed very extensive reservations. Sure. And that's the only person that I knew, and she was only aware of it because Anne Daly made, or sorry, Mrs. Garvey in New York made her aware of it. Mm-hmm. So, a uh, very wise woman, Anne Daly. So, anyway, 
we ratified it with no reservations. And it was that same thing of, you know, when you read, we're now bound every three years, our our whatever, our minister for children or whatever, has to go over to New York and face a committee. And that committee dictates to them what we haven't done yet, what we need to do. And, in fact, every wow. time they've gone, they've dictated to them that we need to deal with our Constitution. You know, we need to deal with that. We need to tidy it up. We need to make it compatible with their convention. Basically, we need to take, to take away the effect. power of the Irish people away from the rights of looking after their own children. And we don't even know this. We don't even know this goes on. Yeah. And they're very interesting. Not easy to find, but I have mm-hmm. them all if anyone wants them. I can, I can, you know, give you the exchanges with Brian Lenahan Absolutely. and, you know, various Irish people over the years. Yeah. Now, so what happens is, so we, we ratified it, we signed it, and then we ratified it. Mm-hmm. And it has been sitting there, and our laws, and you can read this in the reports from Ireland to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, they'll say, oh, we passed that Disability Act, and we passed that uh, Education for Persons with Special Needs Act. Mm-hmm. And there I am in Ireland lobbying with other parents and other groups saying, this is unconstitutional. Mm-hmm. You know, children are entitled to education, not if there are the resources or if mm-hmm. the state feel there are the resources. Because remember, even during the height of the Celtic Tiger, the state didn't think it had enough money to properly educate children with disabilities. Mm-hmm. So they never think they have enough resources. But anyway, that's okay. another issue. Or in fact, it's very much an issue. Kathy, just going to stop you there. The uh, we're going to go to a quick song and we're going to come back then afterwards okay. and continue on with Kathy. And talking about the rights of the children in relation to the Irish Constitution and in relation to the UN uh, Charter on Human Rights. We're back again there now. Cathy, thanks very much for coming back onto the show. Okay. Well, just to, just to say too, it's not the Charter of Human Rights. The UN Charter of Human Rights actually is, it was written right after World War II when people really, uh, they, you know, they had a very different idea. They saw what the state could do. No, this is, this is when the UN forgot about their Charter of Human Rights. And this is called the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And so, if I can just very quickly, um, so that's how it happened. Mm-hmm. But just to tell you very quickly what's in it, because I think that's important. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, Article 2, and I won't go in great detail, but just to kind of quickly, you know, you can look this up yourself. There's a basic principle involved. In Article 2, it it creates what's called children's rights. I mean, the Irish Constitution talks about the rights of children, but it's always, um, you know, that children as persons, it, you know, their inalienable rights as persons with the... Yeah with an infinite dignity and destiny and all this, you know, the real rights. But this gives children all the rights in this convention. So mm-hmm. the UN are going to give children these rights, mm-hmm. you know, a big Santa Claus thing, mm-hmm. you know, sugar daddies. And then it says that the state must ensure all the rights in this convention mm-hmm. against, and among others, it, it actually lists mm-hmm. parents, legal guardians, etc. Okay, just to take you quickly through the convention, what's in it. And as I say, there's some good things in it that came from the Dr. Grant side of UNICEF. But the other side, Article 2, creates what's called children's rights. Mm -hmm. And children have a right to be free from persecution or punishment or discrimination, etc., the state must ensure they're free of these things. And, of course, they're things we want them free of. But they make them free of these things from, among others, parents. So did you ever tell your kids they couldn't have dessert because, uh, etc.? Yeah. It makes them free of these things from parents, from legal guardians, etc., among and other, and mm-hmm. other mm-hmm. bodies. So you can't discipline your children anymore, basically, is what you're saying. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. But then, and the state must ensure that. Mm-hmm. Then Article 3, though, is the, is the real basis that, you know, it's the real thing. It says that everything to do with children must be done on the best interest of the child. Now, this may sound good, mm-hmm. right? It may sound good. 
okay? And that it is the state, the state's party, which is Ireland in our case, mm-hmm. and it is the state that basically decides mm-hmm. what is the best interest of the child. So you have nine kids like me. Yeah. And you have, well, I have more than nine kids. I have my sister's seven as well because mm-hmm. she, she died unexpected. And you maybe don't have a, a very big income or something. Yeah. And they spot your very bright, you know, attractive child in daycare or something at mm-hmm. three or four. And they think, well, this child's really gifted, but will never get the opportunities in that low income home. Right. So the best in that child would be to be taken and adopted out to someone else. Now in Ireland, we can't do that. We can't have compulsory adoption, but it is in, I've seen the wording of two of the drafts of the referendum that's going to be coming. And both of those drafts have mandatory uh, that the state can adopt any child. It that, doesn't give a reason or scary. anything, that's any very child. That's very scary, Cathy. That's so, frightening. So the state can decide the best interest of the child. Now, in, in our constitution and in any civilized country, which is basically all over the world, based most countries, there is a provision that the state can take a child who's in danger from mm-hmm. the parents. But in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, the basis for everything, and it stresses everything, is the best interest of the child, the state deciding what that is. And then it goes on to 18, and it commits the parents that they must do everything in the best interest of the child. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I don't know about you, but, like, I have nine kids, mm-hmm. and I might think to myself, well, uh, it's in my child's best interest to get to go to Italy every year to learn Italian and everything. But you know, we've nine kids and we have to make it spread across the whole lot. We have to keep food on the table. and yeah. You know, so you know, whereas the state will only look at each child individually and say this is what's in their best interest. Mm-hmm. Then 18 commits the parents to this and that legally that's a very odd concept that we didn't sign this. We didn't mm-hmm. ratify it. We didn't even get a referendum. Yet yeah. we have been committed to acting in the best interest of our child, which we do naturally as parents, as we as we see it, but as the state sees the best interest. We've been committed to the state's decision on what's the best interest. Mm-hmm. Then you have a, another one. I think it's 15. I'm just looking here quickly. And it allows, it says that, you know, children have a right to their family, etc., cetera, and c- can only be taken by legal procedure you know and the state decides that legal procedure the state decides what you know and and on the best interest of the child which the state decides yeah so the language sounds great oh a child has a right to their family but only the state on the best interest of that child by a legal procedure it decides on can confiscate any child and christopher booker you know the guy who did such trojan work exposing a lot of stuff going on in the EU mm-hmm. is doing his best to do the same with with child confiscation by authorities in in the UK right now but anyway um so that that kind of completely neutralizes the parents we're there under supervision and it says that parents are in charge of overseeing development of a child so we change the nappies we pay the school fees but the state decides what's in their best interest and i heard on RT or News Talk, I can't remember now, it was about three years ago, one of the times when they were going to, you know, they were, you know, kind of putting their toe in the water about, you know, having this referendum. And they had a panel with Bernardo's and uh, the Minister for Children or somebody, a spokesperson for them, et cetera. And in the panel, they made it very clear that once we have the children's rights referendum, we will be able to mandate vaccinations. This was an example they were giving. Wow. There'll be no more personal choice. They were saying, you know, these parents who put their children in danger, mm-hmm. you know, this sort of thing. Yeah. And and I should I should I should uh, maybe just declare my interest here. My own son Jamie, who is profoundly disabled, was a vaccine victim. Right. So he was normal, healthy, normally developing baby until 
until he got his first vaccine. Wow. There are many so of these anyway, cases now also. on the other hand, yeah. So we, we might talk about that another day. Absolutely. On the other hand, um, the children now. So the parents have been neutralized. They're under supervision, under probation. They get to keep their kids as long as everything is in the individual child's best interest, not the best interest of the family, which, you know, the best interest of the child because the family all has something to eat and, you know, mm-hmm. a, a roof over their heads and all. Um, but then they turn around and they give children five new freedoms. Well, in fact, more than five, but five main new freedoms. And it's these freedoms that make things untenable for parents because in many cases, they're not freedoms parents. They're, they're the very things parents would be kind of careful of. Mm-hmm. And just if I can go through them quickly, I don't know how much time I have and I'm yeah, really plenty, sorry if I'm going time. on too long. Yeah, plenty of time. This is, this is a very important topic, so keep going. It is. So children have, and the new freedoms are expression, information, religion, association, and privacy. Now, they're they're much bigger than that, but they're just the buzzwords at the top of each. Mm-hmm. So the Article 12 gives, and, and remember, all of these, it commits the state to enforcing these freedoms, that the child has these freedoms. Yeah. So the freedom of expression is that the child has a right to express his or her opinion and have it given weight appropriate to their age and capacity, uh-huh. right? And maturity. Public yeah. or private. So any good parent wants their child to speak up. I mean, you know, we're all encouraging our children, but but we don't ask their opinion in everything. You there are a lot yeah. of decisions you don't burden your children You don't with, have the you maturity know, you, at the time, Cathy, to be able to make a decision sometimes for themselves, you know? Oh, yeah, we all, I mean, it's part of parent, parenting that you help children in a graduated way yeah. make decisions. And, you know, in my family, it's called carrots or peas, dear. Mm, yeah. <laughs> you, know, this guy, you know, choice, you know, you give them choices and things and you take their choice very seriously. And as they get older, you give them more. But, but you yeah. know, you you lose your job and you have to move to... Uh, Kilkenny for a new job and you don't say to, to your teenager who you know is going to be very upset at leaving her friends at school, but, but you got to do it because you got to pay a mortgage and you, and you say, look, we've got to move to Kilkenny. Yeah. And, you know, but under this, that teenager, you know, according to her age and capacity, which the state decides, the state decides what say what weight that must be given mm-hmm. not the parent you know uh the state decides that you know and and this is where we've had cases in europe and the u.s even though and and there's an odd thing in the u.s the u.s have never ratified this but the courts have acted as if in many cases as if they have yeah but where where children have sued their parents mm-hmm. you know because <laughs> They decided something else and the family made a different decision, you know, or something like that. Mm-hmm. So, um, and that's the, that's the right of expression. And as I say, many of these things are things parents naturally do, but we do them at a pace that we as parents in our families judge our child is able for, would be good for our children, etc. Yeah. Then information is, uh, article 13. Information and the way it's, and again, the state enforces it. The child has a right to, quote, seek, receive, impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers, either orally, in writing, or in print, in the form of art, or through any other media of the child's choice. Right. Now, I'm always encouraging my kids to gather information, but I do put limits on the computer. Absolutely, you have you to. You know, yeah. I, you know, there's common sense here, but the child, this is an absolute right. Now, mm-hmm. there is, it's, sorry, this isn't an absolute right. There are limits. It uh, does allow for limits, like for public order and things. Mm-hmm. However, those limits, the state decides. It's mm-hmm. not the limits you as a parent put on in the home. Yeah. It's the limits you as the state decide this mm-hmm. can have. Mm-hmm. So... You know, so a parent who wants to limit maybe pornography or predators, mm-hmm. you know, under this, you, you've got to lobby the state to, to do those limits. You can't. Which is completely unreasonable. I mean, you can't get every parent to go and ask permission from the state. That's just completely bonkers, you know? Well, yeah. And, and the thing is that 
the reality is, with or without this convention, within people's own homes, they do what they do. Mm -hmm. However, if that child goes to a teacher, because, of course, in countries that have implemented this fully, yeah. um, goes to a teacher and says, my parents wouldn't let me do this or that, that parent is, is, is liable to be in trouble, yeah. if not lose their child. Not you know, so. in Germany, which has gone very seriously into this, mm -hmm has the highest rate of children in foster care in Europe. Wow. Now, is that because parents are bad parents, or is it because they have so many of these rules, and a child goes and says something at school, that teacher must report it. And, yeah. And, and of course, it's great if you're talking about abuse. We absolutely yeah. want that kind of system. Absolutely. But when you're talking about the fact they didn't let me watch my favorite television program, mm -hmm. you know, et cetera, et cetera. You know, uh, they didn't let me. They said I can't see this boy anymore mm -hmm. because that's that's part is uh, that's another one of the freedoms. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then you have the freedom of thought. So Article 14 guarantees a child freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. And dire it directs the state then to, quote, provide direction to the child in the exercise of his or her right in a manner consistent with the evolving capacities of the child, which is another concept mm -hmm. in this. And who decides what's consistent, mm -hmm. what method or what what information or what values or thoughts, mm -hmm. and who decides the evolving capacity, the state does. Surprise, mm -hmm. surprise. Obviously, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so in a Muslim country, this could be used that uh, a child must only be taught what uh, Sikh or or whichever sect in that particular country or whatever, or we could have Rory Quinn and he could decide this means that a parent can't you know pass on their Church of Ireland or their Catholicism or whatever. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so you know, so it's it's thought, conscience, religion. Then the next one, Article fourteen, the state again guarantees the child the right of association and peaceful assembly. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know about you, but I would have vetted to a certain extent, you know, the people that my are going to be in contact with my kids. Mm -hmm. You know, like you do kind of check out the teacher and, you know, you you check out uh certain things. You you sure. vet them within reason. You have to sure. But the your child well, absolutely. What, but see, this is the thing. What is responsible parenting is actually turned on its head here. This gives the child the right of freedom of association. And again, parents are going to do what parents do. But there's a provision in this that makes that, it, that the state must guarantee that the children are taught their rights. Mm -hmm. So that the, you know, in schools, you must be taught that you have these rights. So it, it's a, it, it just creates, you know, a conflict within families. You know, I mean, how many parents in Germany? I mean, I had a, a girl from Germany uh, working for me at one time, and she used to tell me that every child is taught every year in school. Every child is taught the number to phone. You know, the child line number to phone. Mm -hmm. So if their parent punishes. Or what you know that they've got someone to ring, mm -hmm. and um, and of course we want that for for danger for abuse, not for ordinary parenting. No. Okay, and then there's Article 16. No child, quote unquote. And this is you know the, the language is always so absolute, and mm -hmm. but this is the most absolute of all. No child shall be subjected to arbitrary or unlawful interference with his or her privacy family, home, or correspondence. Mm -hmm. And it goes on to explain that this includes from the parents. So, and this is a problem for parents because parents are, by definition, part of the private life of a child. Mm -hmm. Of course. You know, it's not that you're there reading your children's diary, but your child disappears and and you've got to find out where they are. You know, you're, you're going to go up to their room and see is there any clue, any mm -hmm. hint. But this whole idea, and this is no child, not mm -hmm. a one-year-old, not a five-year-old, not a 17-year-old. Mm -hmm. No child. That privacy is the most absolute right in here. And, of course, privacy in, in other jurisdictions have has been used to, I mean, that was Roe v. Wade, was privacy. Mm -hmm. um, so... 
uh, you know, and and that's now I I've limited what I've told you just to the the hottest of the hot buttons in this, and all of those rights, all of those new freedoms, all of that, and the exact sub subsidiary position of parents. Mm-hmm. This convention says must be taught to children that they know exactly where they stand. Mm-hmm. Well, it sounds like communism to me, Kathy. That's 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 where we're going with this. You know, <laughs> it's uh, it's shocking. Well, it's it's not it's North okay. Korea. Well, been, you know. Well, I, I remember uh, there was a thing called the Lisbon Strategy, at, as opposed to the Lisbon Treaty, and it was the strategy in two thousand that was going to make Europe the most cutting edge economy in the world. This mm-hmm. was the bumper sticker. And the year after the Lisbon strategy, and this was the one where they were going to get all the women out into the workplace and they were going to have full employment of the men and, you know, all sorts of things. All sorts of lies. But the next year they had, oh yeah, well the next year they had what was called the Madrid, or the, um, Barcelona agreement. Mm-hmm. And the Barcelona agreement was looking at all the obstacles to the Lisbon strategy. And part of the agreement was that every child, that by the year 2010, every child, uh, sorry, one third of children under the age of three would be in some form of childcare. Oh my God. And by the age of three, 90% of children would be in some form of childcare. Yes. And the, and I remember we had debates in 2005 we, for the review, we had debates and, um, I had just had my first grandson and I was like, you know, and his mom had six months off and then she was going to have to go back to work. And Mm -hmm. I was saying, well, you know, this is really written by adults because if you ask my new grandson, you know, he wants his mom. That's all he wants. (laughs) Sure. For the time being anyway. But anyway. Cathy, what's the solution to all this? I mean, we we always like to talk about solutions on the show. So, I mean, for us, the solution is to leave the EU, completely leave the EU completely and to give the power back to local communities again like it was a thousand years ago, except in a modern world. You know? Yeah, no, people people power is the solution. In terms of this, the first thing we need to do is to vote no in the children's rights referendum. Yeah. And I maintain that if we vote no in the fiscal treaty, they might be afraid to bring the children's rights because the problem with the children's rights that for them is they've passed a lot of legislation based on a treaty that's unconstitutional, mm-hmm. that the people don't know about. And so this referendum is like when you go for retention planning permission. Mm-hmm. They can't evoke, they can't afford to have a no answer because they'll have to take down the building. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's why every time they've mooted it and there's any debate at all, it's disappeared into the woodwork again. They refuse to have a debate on this. Okay. So I think people need to educate themselves about it. It's all about the UN convention. They need to look at the proposed wording, which includes the adoption of any child. And I have met with two constitutional lawyers on this, one mm-hmm. expert in Irish, the other an expert in the English version. Mm-hmm. And they have pointed it out. This is any child for any reason. The state can do this. Yeah. And, and adoption, not, not mm-hmm. foster and you might someday get the child back. Uh, in, in fact, in the UK, the, the, uh, recently it's come out that 97% of children that are taken into foster care are never returned to their parents oh because God. they can adopt them out. Wow. So, uh, so this is huge. It's huge. People need to really understand. They've got to look at it. This is not small. As far as I'm concerned, they they took our sovereignty, they took our money, they mm-hmm. took everything else with successive, you know, European treaties. Mm-hmm. This, to me, maybe because I'm a mom, this is much bigger because this is they yeah. they're taking our children. Yeah. Well, Connie, and to that, me, that I, is not something you can. Well, you I, can I, I, I've to. got good news for you because there's something called a sovereignty movement happening all over the world, and that I'm one of the people in this country that's helping to yeah. educate people about sovereignty. And there's a big difference between what is lawful and, and what and is you legal. You know. And uh, when yeah. you explain to people that there's a big difference between a lawful obligation and a legal obligation, well, then the state, you, you basically neutralize the power of the state as long as you haven't broken any law, which means no loss, harm, or injury to any other human being. 
and that's where we're at. So unless you've harmed your child, the state has absolutely no lawful authority whatsoever to come near your child. If they do, then you can bring them to court and you can sue them. You know, so yes. you can turn it back yes. on them. So and we have to realise as well is that the state is just another name for a corporation. And once you realise that, well, then it, the power is taken away from them. When you realise you're just a corporation trading for profit and that the shareholders are the ministers and the people working behind the scenes, if that's the case, well, then they don't have really any authority over you once the, the veil is pulled back and you can see the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain. Well, yes, and and I absolutely think you're right, and and that's exactly what we need to do. Um, and in this case, it's not just the state; the state is only a branch of the UN. In sure, this case. which is not a corporation. The problem here, yeah, but the problem here, and this is the this is the key, is that the difference between that and taking your home is that. Well, to as great an extent as possible, you can bring people in, you can stand your ground on your home mm -hmm. and and hopefully retain your home and, and have a standoff. When they take their, your kids, they take your kids. I know. And even yeah. if you could manage a standoff, even if you mm -hmm. can hang on to them, you know, you're going to traumatize them just even mm -hmm. in the struggle. Mm -hmm. So we need to be as smart as we can. Absolutely. We need to, as you say, understand our sovereignty and our families mm -hmm. if we're good parents if we love our kids mm -hmm. we're all doing our best we all have different ideas on how to raise kids mm -hmm. but we need to avoid this and yeah. we've got to vote no and what we need to do is start letting the state know we're wise to this because they won't bring the referendum mm -hmm. if that we're wise to it we need to start seeing all of those laws that they've brought and and we need to open up the in camera thing too because they're already taking children not to adoption but to foster they're already doing it hiding behind the in camera rule right so we need to expose that wizard of oz has to be exposed but we mm -hmm. need to you know we need to play smart because they take your kids you don't get them back yeah well, the Awaken Ireland movement is, is basically about helping the people to understand their individual sovereignty as well as national sovereignty, you know, and it's a grassroots sure. movement and the idea of Awaken Ireland is to help educate everybody on a local level to make sure that sure. they understand their rights, to understand their individual rights, the rights within the constitution and the power that that gives you. And if enough people actually understand that, Cathy, because that's what we're trying to do, we're traveling around the country, we're given you know, or talks to people, we're sitting down, we're getting people yeah. to talk amongst You're themselves. Doing you know? Yeah. Go on, Cathy. I have great hopes for this. I have mm -hmm. great hopes for this because no one has heard about this that it hasn't made perfect sense. It, it's, you know, as you're saying, with the Awaken movement, people are waking up. Mm -hmm. And the reason that this has gone as far as it's gone, I mean, it's been 19 years they've been you know, slowly doing this agenda is because people didn't know. Sure. And 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 it was hidden behind in camera courts, you know, when it was having an effect. But the minute people hear about it, it's making sense to them. Mm -hmm. And so I think I I great hope that if we can just like with programs like this, the Awaken movement, you know, that the articles I'm doing a series of articles that are being published in Alive and then I'm spreading them online. Other people are doing the same. I think that we can we can not just you know, make them scurry off with their referendum or defeat the referendum, but we can start rowing back on all the all the laws and all the policies that they have done um, mm -hmm. based on this treaty, which should never have been ratified as is anyways. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Cathy, I mean, we'd love for you to get involved with this Awaken movement because it's a grassroots movement and we yeah. will be getting yeah. in getting stuck in locally and helping people to, to find solutions themselves so people have the solutions at hand they just haven't been allowed to develop them over time because the, the state and the, the European Union and the United Nations being the monsters that they are they keep taking away individual power from people so once we we, we can reverse that yeah. trend and it's true education and it's true dialogue you know and that's the only way we're ever going that's to right. get turn, right. reverse things, Cathy. You know yourself. You've been in the belly of the beast. You've been to the European Union. You've been a member uh, of Parliament. You know how the system works. Sure, sure, absolutely. And you know what? The Emperor is wearing no clothes. <laughs> well, I think this hasn't been a better time for, for, you know, for people to, to reverse their, their life situation, their people communities are and everything. 
people are ready now to listen. I think so. And, you know, when things are good, when there's lots of artificial money floating around, people, I think it's hard for them to listen, but they're listening now. They are. And I'm happy to do anything I can. I've been actually following the awake, and I, I remember going up to uh, speak with, I think, the group, one of the prototype, proto groups, mm-hmm. oh, maybe a year and a half ago. Okay. And we had a great long chat, you know, we picked each other's brains and Mm -hmm. no, and I follow it online all the time. I follow it. I'm on the email list and I'm just really excited about the Awaken movement. Fantastic. Well, the plan is for this radio show is that we're going to do a live show uh, every Sunday from 12 to half to 3 o'clock and then we're going to put a podcast up on the internet which can be shared everywhere and that's the idea because interviews like this, you will not get the time that we're giving you uh, today uh, on interviews uh, like this, this, this style of interview, because they're just so under pressure all the time, Cathy, to move on, move on, move on. But if you can get give somebody an hour like we're giving you here, you can really get into the belly and get an understanding of, of the core issues that are that, that are so important for people to understand. Well, that's right. And the thing is, for the Awaken movement, people have to get back to actually going deep into issues. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've all been trained that it's all sound bites and it's all this and don't think too deeply. Yeah. And that's why it's really important to go, you know, mm-hmm. and, and really to get off an interview and then go in and actually start researching it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Is there any websites that people can look at uh, to follow up on this information? I, I think they, if they go into the UN uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child, read the document. As I say, don't be fooled by the nice-sounding language. Just remember that every provision, and it then it turns it on its head. And I'm happy to, it was very difficult to get all the exchanges with Ireland. Mm-hmm. I actually had to go to the Department for Children to get some of them. So my email is kathysinnott at gmail.com, and it's Kathy with a K, and S-I-N-N-O-T-T. And I'm happy to send, maybe I should send it to you, and you can put some of these documents as a link. Uh, sure, yeah, no problem. Yeah, so that because, as I say, it took me months to get one or two of them. Mm-hmm. So I can give them to you. People can link in, and mm-hmm. they can actually read you know, Brian Linehan explaining, God God rest his soul, Brian Linehan explaining to the UN that he had to go slowly, that the Irish people are attached to their constitution, and that's why we haven't been able to change it yet. Mm-hmm. You know, and we have no intentions apologies. of changing it except for the betterment of the people, and not corporations, and that's what we really want to hit home, is that there is a massive difference between uh, what you a, a, a group of people as in they live together on an island and what a corporation is and the agenda of corporations and that's something that people really need to understand, you know. That's right. They That they are human beings infinitely with an infinite dignity and destiny and they should never settle for less. Absolutely. And I have a small piece of information there for our listeners. Um, there are actually 25 registered corporations in Ireland who deal with adoptions. So uh, obviously it's big business here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's it's small peanuts compared to a country that has fully implemented the UN Convention because sure. then, right now, they're limited in the children they can adopt. Once you bring in, once this referendum goes through and they have completely gotten rid of our constitution on children, then it will become huge business because, you know, we're just, it, it'll be an open market for children. They yeah. can confiscate anybody's children. Yeah, yeah. It's turning, turning. It's like turning us into the film, The Matrix, where the 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 babies are just just uh, energy cells, you know, for 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 the state's profit. <laughs> that's right. But that's the way it's heading, Cathy. That's Cathy, right. Cathy, well, can I ask one question? of the things, Christopher. Yeah, go on. One of the things Christopher Booker has pointed out is that a lot of the, you know, swoop in, make a charge, take the child. Often they're attractive. They're white mm-hmm. and they're bright. Yeah. And they're out of the nap stage. Mm-hmm. And they're out of the nappy stage. Mm-hmm. Just ready to go to a nice, wealthy, professional couple or whoever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And just slightly off topic there, uh, Cathy, were you involved in, in, in the documentary film The Pipe? Did you? No, ha- I wasn't. You were pi- Wait, hold on. The Pipe. Oh, yeah. Did you help, help this out, is help on out the, Cor- uh, the fishermen that. Oh, 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 yeah, were you involved with that? 
Oh, I'm trying to remember. I, I was involved in several film projects, so I don't know if I... If I'm there, I was, but... I'm really uh, sure I that, that, I, that I saw you, uh, it was in the, the film, the, the documentary, where the fishermen came over from Rossport, and they were, they were, they were going to the, U, the, the EU uh, because oh, of... Oh, yes, I brought them over. Yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah, I, yeah. I brought fishermen over two or three times and yeah. brought them right into the commission. And it was great because the commission, uh, the, you know, when you get to the... The people, not the you know, not the ones with the big agendas, but the people kind of doing the everyday work. Yeah, they didn't know a lot of the stuff our fishermen had to give them. No, I did a lot of work with our fishermen. Great, great. And how did that work out in the end? Well, this is the problem. We were making real headway. Mm-hmm. I mean, we had an open invitation to inform this this inner, you know, clique in the in the commission. And then I wasn't reelected, and and it's kind of like you have all these things that you're just in the middle of, or you're really making progress, and then it's gone. So I don't know how it's. And that's gone a pity because then. that that is still ongoing up in Rossport there with Shell, you know, Royal Dutch Shell, yes. and they're destroying the oh, ecosystem yeah. there with the the dig, digging up of the pipes, uh, digging up of the the beach that's there for the pipes, you know, which is which is and a of course now the area. Cork. cork Going to have a situation as well with the new gas find, oil find in Cork, mm-hmm. uh, and in no onus on them to hire Irish people to uh, use the you know give us any share of the proceeds really or anything. Very much the same situation. So yeah, well, those we'll see what those, um, those licenses could be renegotiated at any time as well. And this is something else that we're trying to help to educate the people about because I was part of the Occupy movement and that was one of the points that we had highlighted that the licenses were they were given away under under uh, Ray Burke, you know, for for uh, for next for a song basically. But there's no reason why we can't renegotiate. But we can't until the current uh, political system is restructured to allow us to be able to do that. Well, because yeah, James, James, there's no question that when they bought those for a song, they knew it was a shady deal. Yeah. So I, I never considered those a valid deal. Mm-hmm. I always have felt that number one, Ray, you know, was selling stuff that wasn't his to sell. Yeah. The people buying it knew they were buying stolen goods. Mm-hmm. You know, at a knockdown price, they bought it off the back of a car, if you like, uh-huh. and that there was nothing valid about that from the beginning. And of yeah. course, we can, you know, uh, we can go back on that. Well, we'll get there. So thank you very much, Cathy, for appearing on the show. And um, we're looking Great. forward well, to thanks uh, for having me and thanks for the work it. you're doing. Well, we'll hope to get you on the show again in the future with, with a further update. And any, anything else that you want to talk about as well that you feel is of oh, vital importance for the Irish people to listen in on, just to send, send us an email and we'll get you back on the show. Great. God bless. Thank, Thank you very bye. much. Bye bye. So that was Cathy Sinnott there with James O'Sullivan. And uh, that was basically it for tonight. Thanks for listening in, folks. Um, We'll be seeing you next Sunday evening at 12 o'clock with some more info updates, hopefully. And um, it's been a long night. Thanks for listening in, and have a good night. Good night, everybody, and we'll talk to you again next week. So from me and Paul, good night.